Hello, everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Transatlantic Rebels podcast. It's a good one this week, I have to say. Uh, we're revisiting the world of Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I think it's their third film this year and the last one of 2017. And it is the third, uh, the third film in the sequence of what has previously been a somewhat uneven, it's fair to say, previous couple of films. Um, it's the Thor trilogy, and this is specifically about Thor Ragnarok, and it's just about Thor Ragnarok. Originally, we were going to do like the Marvel films of 2017, but we've actually already talked about Spider-Man Homecoming and uh, what was the other one? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. We talked about that in the first episode of, of this season back in August or so. So um, this is all about Thor Ragnarok, and to be perfectly honest... It deserves it because, spoiler alert about my opinions, not about the film. We're going to do a spoiler-free section. Um, this is probably, I don't know, this might well be my favourite Marvel film ever thus far. Wow. Perhaps, yes. Mm. Uh, I'm hoping to crystallise that viewpoint um, o- over the course of the next sort of 45 minutes or so. So um, so i tell you what, shall we do a quick kind of spoiler-free section as much as we can? Mm. Uh, and, and then we'll jump into it. So, um, so Rashad, what are your um, your thoughts on on Thor Ragnarok? Um, it's weird because um, I think the biggest thing that everybody's been saying about this movie was the, was the humor, which it's it's funny because the other Thors did have humor in it, but not to this level. But it's not necessarily like new to Thor that he has a sense of humor. But I think it's because the director Taka Waititi, who directed, I don't know if anybody's seen. Um, what we do in the shadows, which is like a, a spoof on vampires and vampires lifestyle and um, hunt for the wilder people, which is about like this, um, this boy who was adopted by this uh, Australian family or maybe New Zealand. I'm, I, I, it throws me back a little bit, but basically it's like he has a gift of like taking dark themes and kind of lightening it up. But at the same time, he still keeps it. If you really pay attention to what he's doing, he's really like making a commentary on certain things. And I think Thor of Ragnarok is no less. But I think right now people are more focused on the human. I mean, the humor than anything else right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, humor is one of the key words. But for me, I'll kind of wrap it up in the word entertainment. This is the most entertaining Marvel film that I think there's been, perhaps, because it's not too long. It mixes together lots of different things, like incredible humor. I mean, it's it's practically, I'd say half of it is just basically a comedy film. Forget anything else. Um, there are great action sequences. There's solid storylines, a good villain. Um, I don't think it's a 10 out of 10 classic or anything like that. But I just think, I, I know in 10 years time, when I'm rewatching all the Marvel films or whatever, I'll look back on this one and think, yes, this is one that I could repeatedly watch because it's just entertaining. And there are other ones throughout Marvel that I think I could watch. There are other ones which I just literally want to watch once and that's it, or just for the sake of it. Um but this one, I just connected to it and, you know, the whole cinema was just in fits of laughter. And then yeah. when there were actual proper action sequences, people were, were pretty kind of, you know, glued into it and stuff. And I just think it hit like pretty much all the markers that it needed to. And it was also just such a surprise in in tone in terms of compared to the previous one. I mean, I thought the first Thor film was pretty solid. It was OK. I thought the second one was dreadful. I mean, honest to God, if you ask me to name three things from the second Thor film, no, uh, but I'm not even being sarcastic. I genuinely couldn't do it. I could name, oh, gosh, okay, uh, 
Kat Dennings, isn't it? Um, that guy takes his trousers off. The 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 scientist guy, what is it? Who's Stellan Skarsgård or something? That's pretty much it. I can't remember anything apart from that. Um, Loki being an arsehole. I don't know. That's it. Just dreadful. Poor film. Really poor film. And like, I, I know the director of this one has, you know, had to be kind of complimentary about the previous two films. But, you know, realistically, it was a flop. And I mean, by Absolutely. kind of, you know, the in comparison. Marvel yeah, by Marvel yeah. standards. But even just as a general film, I don't think it was very good, to be honest. This, yes, this, this kills it. I think the cast, almost all the cast do a, a very solid job or, or an exceptional job. Um, I think I think this is kind of different to the previous two ones, which were kind of like a very much fish out of water thing. You know, you, you stick Thor, who's this, you know, abnormal Nordic god type of thing with lots of superpowers, put him in a really mundane situation and then watch the kind of comedy or whatever ensue. This, I think, was very different. This is him going on a, on a kind of much like sort of like a Greek god, like odyssey kind of thing, going through different galaxies and being placed in different situations and then the humor is just much more of a dry humor like that kind of you know it's it's very british or new zealand type of humor yeah um uh, it's not to say that american sense of americans don't have a sense of humor that's not the case it's just this this was a very kind of original tone compared to the rest of the marvel ones um i, I think ant-man is the one that people keep referring to saying well or, or even like part of iron man you know and I think I think those are valid comments, but I think this just took it to the next level. Like it treated the comedy seriously, um, so I loved it. But but there's a lot a lot more in this film. There is there's there's a lot in this film that isn't funny at all and has a lot of dramatic um, consequence. But you know we'll get to that. But I mean regardless, I mean I think this definitely easily easily in my top three. I haven't gone through and made a list or anything, but it's easily in my top three. So um, I would urge the listeners if you haven't seen the film. Just go watch it. I mean, if you haven't seen any of the Thor films, then I don't really know what to say <laughs> because, I'd, like, I don't know if you should sit through the first two just to get to this one. Like, if you're not that bothered, um, I'd probably just say just go watch this one. I don't know. What do you think, Rashad? I mean, you don't have to, but I will say it, it, this is what I have to say about the Marvel movies over and over again. There's two. There's two ways they work, and this is how this is how it pretty much works. You can pretty much there, there, there's this myth where you have to watch all the Marvel movies to watch each one. And I, and I always make, I always go back to what George Lucas said about the first Star Wars. And I think people miss sometimes. I think there's a lot of lazy criticisms when it comes to Marvel. But, uh, but one of the biggest ones is like, you have to watch the other ones to watch it. And George Lucas made his point in the commentary of the original Star Wars, where basically if you watch the original Star Wars, you're literally walking in on like half the, half the movies already have been told. Yeah. And you're walking into this thing where it's like, you don't know the relationship between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader. You, like this old man saying this and that, like you don't know their background history. Walking into the Civil War, the Emperor is not nowhere to be. They talk about the Emperor, but nobody even knows what the hell he's about or what he looks like or what he's doing. You don't know what the prince is really fighting for. It's like, George Lucas said, he liked the ideal of you walk, just walking into this world and trying to gather your thoughts. And it's the same way with the, with the Marvel movies in the sense where it's like each one has a specific story that it follows. And you can pretty much follow that story from beginning to end, where basically this one is basically like, um, and I'm not, ruining, I'm not ruining the plot for the spoiler thing, where basically Thor has to get back to, Thor winds up being um, exiled from his own kingdom, which is Asgard. He has to go back and stop Ragnarok from happening. And Ragnarok is pretty much like the destruction of the prophecy that his home his home world will be destroyed by this demon or whatever like that. He has to get back to there. And then there's some twists and turns that go here. But basically, you can pretty much... You, the, the plot of the story is really basically even told for you at the beginning of the movie. Not even five minutes in, Thor tells you what he's going to do. And then the story kind of follows that. It takes detours like a road trip. But basically, that's the plot right there. However, I would say... If you're a fan of the universe, then there's a lot more to the movie than what's on the surface. But if you go into the movie, watch on the surface, you'll get the beginning, the middle, the end of the story, and you can move on right there. So it can go either way. If you don't give a shit about any of the Marvel movies, I mean, you can literally go into almost any one and just watch it. And, okay, I got this is a story to move out. And, or if you're more interested, then you go into, it, go into it later on. But I don't think you have to watch the original three. But I will say that there's things with Odin that kind of play through the other two. That add more texture and it's kind of like a theme that goes to the rest of the movies but you don't have to do that if you don't want to yeah if anything i, I would recommend this is the last thing i'll say before we jump to the spoilers is that mm. if you were taking someone who wasn't really that bothered about marvel ones and was just like oh you know whatever and more of a casual film viewer and if you gave them this film then this would be a 
great gateway drug into Marvel. You know, that, don't get me wrong, not every other film is like this, obviously, but if you talk about the quality level of entertainment, then I think then they were just... I struggle to see who wouldn't like this film in some respect. There's a lot of people don't like it. Really? Yeah, there's a lot. Like normal people, like normal people. Like It's like that with every Marvel movie. For, for every person that thinks one movie's great, there's a couple of three or two. There's people who prefer the first or over this one, to be honest with you. Oh my God. And that, and that goes for all Marvel movies. Like I made this comment on um on on Twitter the other day. There's 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 this Twitter social media consensus that Winter Soldier is the best Marvel movie. But if you actually watch, if you actually pay attention, and, and like I, because I'm writing this big giant paper on everything once the Avengers four gets done about like social media and all stuff like that. But if you actually watch social media and actually look at social networking and stuff like that. There's this, there's this, it's like the same thing with Empire Strikes Back, where people say Empire Strikes Back, the best Star Wars movie. But then if you actually look on Twitter and look at and you actually look beyond your own bubbles, you'll find people who prefer Return of the Jedi, like people who return that, that prefer Star Wars. And I always, I, I kind of push back against this universal, like universally loved thing. But I will, I will say that I think for a lot of people, the same way some people think that when it's always the best movie, I think for a lot of people, this is going to be their favorite Marvel movie. I did say it on Twitter. I was like, I think for, for a large number of people, this might just be their face more favorite Marvel movie going forward. I, I just think if you talk about entertainment value, yeah. you know, Winter Soldier, yeah, you can say amongst Marvel fans, okay, you can make mm-hmm. an argument that's the best movie. If you talk about just some, just say, take my wife for example, she's mm-hmm. probably seen like four or five of the Marvel films. Most of them are mm-hmm. probably Iron Man ones. I don't know. Um, if I showed her this film, she would enjoy it. She would absolutely enjoy it. Um, and I, I don't think she's even really watched the first two Thor films. So if you're just t- taking the normal person who goes to cinema as opposed to like someone who's a huge Marvel fan, then I think we're talking about different things, basically. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I mean, I mean, but a- we're kind of like, I guess we're kind of digressing a little bit already. Um, sorry, what was your last point going to be? No, I was going to say that's that's going to wind up being a thing after Avengers 4 comes out and everybody takes a, a step back of the tapestry. I think there's some people who just prefer certain movies over. There's some people to this day that think I, they never topped Iron Man 1. There's so many people that have so many different opinions. And I enjoy it because like this is just showing you that whole university love thing. It's, I throw that into question. I always throw that into question. But especially with this film series right here. Like I said, I believe that there's going to be so many people that this is going to be their favorite Marvel movie and wouldn't care about seeing any other one. Like I'm pretty sure there's going to be some people next in February that Black Panther is going to be their favorite Marvel movie. And then there's going to be some people who say Infinity War is going to be their favorite Marvel movie, and so on and so forth. Mm. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how that's going to be. But I don't doubt there's going to be a large number of people that is going to say that this is going to be their favorite Marvel movie. Okay, I tell you what, after this musical mm-hmm. interlude, we are going to jump into the spoiler section of this review. Okay, we're back. So from here on in, it's spoilers. We're going to assume that you have seen Thor Ragnarok. Right. Deep breath. Uh, so what did you think, Rashad? I personally, it, it's funny because going into it, the, there, there's, the biggest thing about it, going back to social media I was talking about before, is that there's this weird contingent of people who think that if you're going to have something as serious as Ragnarok, then there should be no jokes. And, I'm just, and, I'm, and as a person who who watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel, I don't know if anybody on there are either old enough to understand or even know what the shows. But basically, the shows are they, they deal with dark themes. But the writer and creator Joss Whedon would always uncover humor just to balance it out because you don't want to have too much somberness going on. So when so going into the movie, you hear this you hear to continue to people talking about, um, well, it's going to be so humorous that nothing will be taken seriously. But after my second time watching it. And I look at the themes of it. I'm like, the theme is pretty dark if you look at what's going on right there. And he's, and he's cushioning it in certain things. And if you look at the bigger picture of Marvel movies, then you'll see it's an ongoing theme about like how with Marvel movies, like the good, the good guys aren't necessarily good the whole time. And how they build up these different like um, societies. They're not as good as you think they were. So, me, so when you see Thor doing the stuff, which that's the most comedy thing of it, where meanwhile you got... Kate Blanchett playing the main villain, Hela, and she's pretty much breaking down like your perception of what Asgard was. Asgard just seemed like the good of the good. They're pretty much space police in Marvel Universe. And then you kind of tear down like how they got there in the first place. So I think that the the Hela stuff kind of bounced out the humor stuff. But of course, the humor stuff is going to take like front and center because you're with Thor most of the time. 
Yeah. It didn't bother me. Oh, okay. I mean, what I was going to say is um, I think there's a difference between asking someone what their favorite or what they think the best film is. You know, I, I think this is the most entertaining Marvel film I think there's been hands down. I just don't think there's, you, you could have, obviously you can have different tastes and stuff like that, but if you're just going to give it to a hundred people, uh, make a hundred people watch all the Marvel films. I think this is the one thus far that they would find the most entertaining. And I think that's the key word. However, there are, there are also multiple layers within this film. Like I haven't watched it twice. You've seen it twice. I'm sure on your second viewing, you probably picked up loads of other stuff as well. You know, um, like, Whilst I was watching it, then I, w- I was picking up various things here and there and stuff, um, like most of it, I think. But then I afterwards, I was kind of thinking back. I thought, oh, I think I missed this bit or whatever, whatever. And and or I read a review or something, and it and it pointed out something that made me think of it in a different dimension and stuff like that. Are you talking about the c word? Are you talking about the c word? What's the c word? Colonialism. Colonial. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. I thought you just okay. meant the really dirty c word, which no, 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 no. Um, colonial. No, didn't even think of that. Mm-hmm. So what's that about then? No, talking about basically how Odin got got his power, and kind of like, kind of like that whole entire thing of like manifest destiny. Kind of like they, the reason why the nine realms are even the way they are. And hell, I make an argument that why did he stop at nine? He had to change your heart. He kind of called it on the bullshit. That he had when Thor was sitting on the golden when when. When Thor was sitting on the Golden Throne, and she asked Thor, she was like, "How do you think he got all this golden stuff here? How, what yeah. do you think he got that from?" Yeah, that kind of thing right there. How Hela starts stripping away all that, like the whole the whole Sistine ideal, like that whole like uh, that Renaissance kind of artwork, and she kind of like rips it apart, and then you see like the actual way that Asgard actually was before Odin had to change her heart. And she makes the argument that when if you look at the original Thor, how how um, Odin took like Loki. He says that's Odin's whole entire thing. He takes stuff and then makes it for it and takes it, make it his own, and then he hides that shit. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I picked up on that. I didn't think about it in a colonialism stuff, which makes a lot of sense actually. Um, mm-hmm. I thought, I tell you what, let, let's just start off because I think there are going to be so many talking points. Um, yeah. Let's start off just going through the cast members, um, okay, one by one. So, how do you think Chris Hemsworth did his Thor? I think they unleashed his humorous side because up to this point, like there was always a humorous side to Thor. And I think like going back to what you said, the, the problem that a lot of people had with the dark world was it felt like it was too drab and too dour. And it's like, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. And I think at this point, you know, I'm being involved to humans. I think the argument was, I think they said that when, when uh, Chris Hammer was doing ghostbusters, everybody discovered how funny he was yeah. in vacation, even though his movies weren't as enjoyable, but they said he was like a standout because he's so funny. And I think that with him and Taka Watiti, I think they just let him cut loose. And I think for many people, except for maybe the people for Thor One, um, I think that even my brother, who's not a fan of the Thor movies, when we saw it, when we saw it, like he enjoyed Thor more in this movie than anybody else because it felt like he was just able to cut loose. And then there were still those moments where you had it where you can kind of see the undercurrent of sadness. He would always bring some kind of thought back to his father, kind of lost. So when people said like he didn't really like mourn his dad's death. He was in a situation where it was hard to kind of like um like focus on that, but he did take the time out here and there to kind of acknowledge that he did lose his father and kind of going through that. And his father still kind of talked to him from beyond the grave, kind of like an Obi-Wan kind of situation. So when people tell me that he, he negated the whole entire thing with his dad being dead, sometimes I make this argument. Maybe I'll say this thing. I'll say this much. Sometimes I think there's an argument. I think we're so used to like, like typical beats of sadness in the movie that um when somebody just... Respect your intelligence and say, okay, we understand that you know he lost it. And we'll pepper it here and there that you kind of understand he's still going through it. As compared to like typical movies where like they make you like live with it for a little bit sometimes. I don't know if that's sometimes how people feel. Like they're so used to the traditional way of kind of like, okay, let's breathe with the morning and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's kind of like you want to still have the uplifted spirit. But at the same time, just remember that this is some serious stuff going down. So. Yeah, I mean, on that point, and I'll get back to sort of Thor himself. Um, I think they didn't give a lot of breathing space in this movie. It really moved quickly. It was, you know, frame by frame, incredibly quickly. And and the funny thing is people keep talking about, you know, the loss of Odin, but also there was the loss of his hammer. You know, that's a really big thing. And he was in mourning at the loss of his hammer because he connected so much. He didn't believe in himself, you know, and his own power until like the end of the film. And he connected so much with that hammer and then seeing Hela just crush it, just as if it was like, you know, made of balsa wood or something. And, 
that that must have become you know if, i know like we're just talking about fictional characters whatever but if, you, if you're talking about like the the sort of process behind why he would act certain ways then it makes sense you know it's just that it's done in a really rapid quick fire succession so it doesn't have that traditional like you know three minutes of him looking into the distance longingly with some violin music you know you have like 10 seconds bang gone and some other shit happens basically so uh, and and i think that's that's the director perhaps crediting the audience with a bit more now, yes. you know, um, getting back to Chris Hemsworth, uh, I think he was brilliant in this. I think in the first, in the first two films, um, I've always thought he was a good actor anyway, but in the first two films, I think Thor was like this kind of reactive. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but it's kind of like he was a comic this character. This he character. was a comic figure. Yeah. yeah, but he wasn't like this fountain of comedy. It was kind of like, like I said, that fish out of water thing where because he was just, you know, like standing next to London Eye or something and, you know, it was funny. Ha ha ha. Okay, he's in London. You know, whereas this, he was actually a force of comedy. That He was delivering some great lines. He had some brilliant slapstick stuff as as an actor and as well as the actual character himself. You know, it, this was really well-rounded comedy. I also think, I bet that they got this director in because he's a New Zealander and Chris is uh, an Australian. And, you know, not saying before any Aussies or New Zealanders, if, if any Kiwis are out there, please don't take offence. I'm just saying that, you know, Aussies and Kiwis sometimes share like a sort of similar dry humour kind of thing. I'm sure these guys would have connected in terms of the star and the director on a really, really special level. Because I, I think Chris Hemsworth has said it, you know, he's kind, he kind of... Yeah. He was a bit upset about the reaction to certain thought, like especially the last Thor film. I think he said like Kevin Smith in a podcast was ragging on it, and it, it, this kind of prompted this fire and stuff. And I'm sure he would have been in discussions with with Marvel and said, "Look, we need to make sure the third one's good." I know, like, don't get me wrong. I know, like, Marvel is they they frequently set up the first two to be, you know, whatever, and then the third one they'll knock it out of the park. But this this is like such a step up from the previous two that this is like an irrational step up. I think they must have put so much thought and and it's a massive risk with take with the director they, they they brought in. Like there's no pedigree of like blockbuster films or anything like that. And I think that they they did it deliberately. Is that and and if I'm you know, Kate Blanchett, she's Australian. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. And and I'll, urban. when Go we urban. get to her, I've got a really interesting point to make because. I think there was something a bit off, actually. Um, but I just think he did a great job. I think Thor had a lot of character this time around. Uh, in so it's straight, straight from the opening scene when he's dangling around in that chain and just he's just like, "Sorry, can you just hold on?" And like, all this kind of stuff, you know, it's it just fantastic. And I mean, yeah, he, I saw I saw Ghostbusters, the most recent one. Um, you know, I'm a feminist. That film was trash. Uh, he was probably the only decent thing in it, uh, and he was funny in it. You know. So um, I, I think I think he did a brilliant job. I don't think you could have asked anything more of him from from him in this film. Um, okay, how about Tom Hiddleston as Loki? I mean, I, I see. I was never I was never on the Loki bandwagon, so I, I don't really have any strong opinions about Tom Hiddleston either way or other. I know he does a good job, and he's always like he's always good on there. But I've never been one of the people that said he was the best Marvel villain. I have my own personal favorite villain, even though that's just my thing. But for me, I think he just did as, as as good as he always done. I've never seen Tom Hiddleston do anything terrible in any of the Thor movies or even the first Avengers movie. So for me, he was just Loki as Loki. He's like he's a mischief guy. I mean, he did grow in this movie in a sense, but it's only a matter of time before he goes he flip flops back and forth because that's just his nature. Like you never know what things he's doing. I think his best the the, the best moment that sums up Loki is when um, Bruce Banner comes in, when they have him tied up and Bruce Banner talks to him. And he says, last time I saw you trying to kill New York. And then he says, where are you at now? He was like, I don't know. I'm still trying to decide. And that's Loki in a nutshell, pretty much. Like he has that both of those sides. And I think that's what attracts people so much to Loki. Because I think, I think more than anything, Loki kind of like is probably the most human character in the Thor movies up to this point. I mean, since Bruce Banner came, that's a different story. But he's probably like from the Asgardians, he's probably the most relatable character in those movies because he just has that ability to flip flop between good or bad, and sometimes even at the same time in a certain scene. Yeah, I've read a lot of criticism about how they use Loki in this film. I mean, not not of Tom Hiddleston, but mm. I think a lot of people think that he was a bit misused or underused in this film, or that mm. there wasn't enough, like there wasn't enough character development 
you know, explaining his rationale behind his various decisions in this film, which actually I can, I can kind of understand because it, it is a bit random. It is a bit scattershot. And it's easy to say, well, just, that's Loki. You know, you just don't know what... He's like the weather. You don't know what he's going to be one day to the other. Mm. Um, but... I mean, that's, that is his character. Yeah, I mean, I can see that, but I, I don't know if it ultimately... I don't know how well it worked within this particular film, but I just... I love him. I, I, I think he's so cool. Like, I could take... I'm probably one of the outliers, but I could probably take a solo film of his, to be honest. Like, I think I think that would be really cool, especially after seeing how good this Thor film has been. Um, you know, his comic timing is brilliant. In, in this film, I, I don't know if it was his best moment, but it was certainly perhaps like one of the funniest, is when he's watching Thor against Hulk in the battle arena thing, and Hulk starts smashing Thor, like, side to side. And he's like, yes, now you know how it feels. <laughs> he's just like, yeah. you know, and and... And then, like, you just, I don't know if it was a little bit contrived, certain things, like when they're at the, the sort of on the way to that spaceship thing and stuff, and you don't know if he's good or bad or whatever, whatever. But I, I just generally enjoy it. I think Tom Hiddleston does a great job with him. Um, I think it's one of the best Marvel, like, it's one of the best kind of character actor, like, roles in Marvel. I think that it's just they're perfect for one another. And, um, I don't know. I think. I think in general, I'd say it was definitely solid. I don't think everything makes sense, but I. I. I mean, you know, you can be charitable and say, "Well, that's Loki. Not everything makes sense." So, yeah. you know, there, there are some people in this life that you're just never going to figure out. <laughs> and like, exactly. Yeah. I, I guess this is even what even even, even Thor says it. even Thor says it. He was like, "I don't know which way you're going to blow." Yeah. I just accepted that. I was like, I'm sure there's good in you. I'm sure that's it. It's like Thor. I think more the thing with the thing with the thing with the thing that Taika Waititi said about the movie is. It's like every character, and this is what Marvel does with their main characters, and I think this is what people misunderstand sometimes. They're not really um, ensemble movies. Every every character is meant to service the main character. And that's the whole thing Taika Waititi said with Thor movies. Like, he's like, Thor should be the, the, the best and most well-rounded character in that movie. And everybody should be, in, and like, that's, and, and, and I think maybe that's the, I think maybe because being a comic book fan, I understand this more than other people. I mean, I think movies don't do this way because movies you expect everybody to be like an ensemble, and in Marvel movies to a point there are relatively ensemble. But if the, the the name on a marquee should be the character that's being most focused on, and everybody should kind of like have a reflection onto that. And I think what Loki was in that situation, even though he has his own little thing, he's still pushing the pulling because the thing with Loki is his story's not done yet. His story's in between. So whatever the thing, I think the the the, the plus and the minus of Marvel Universe is, is that these because it's a serialized story, like their character arcs are ongoing and it's not going to be revealed until after 2020 where Loki really ends up at. And this is another one of those transitional things because at the end of the movie, he's on Thor's side, whereas the last couple of movies, he was dissing himself from Thor. And I think this is the first ending in any of these movies where Loki and Thor are side by side. They understand who each other are. They're not trying to change who the other person is. There's, I accept you for who you are and I accept for who you are and we're going to take it from there in a sense. It's not Thor trying to chase Loki like he tried to change him or bring him back from negativity. But at the same time, for Thor's character, Thor's not falling for that shit anymore. And that scene where Loki kind of like like sneaks off again, Thor's not falling for it again. Thor's come a long way from being a naive guy. Like, you know what? I believe there's good in Loki. I can pull him back, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what? I tried my best with you. I still love you as a brother, but you're going to be who you're going to be. Yeah, it was that scene in the in the elevator, wasn't it? I think that was the kind of key yeah relationship development between them and yeah i think you're right um okay capes blanchett as hella i'll let you go first okay um i love kate blanchett she's one of my favorite actresses i think she's if you take kind of like from 20 like let's say 20 25 years ago 30 years ago if meryl streep was the outstanding actress in the whole world or whatever um and then like 15 minute, fifteen years later, you kind of had Judy Dench, <laughs> even though she's older. I think Kate Blanchett is definitely the best. Um, whatever best means, but I think whatever role she commits to, she's just incredible. I think she's really good as Hella. Um, I think when I was watching her initially, I was like, wow. And then as the film wore on, I was kind of like, I, I, it dropped like a little bit for me. Um, but th- there's a few things. Um, first of all, I think she's a, finally... Yeah, and I know this will piss you off, but finally, I think there's an actual worthy villain in a Marvel film um, uh, in terms of, like, an obvious hammy one who's just, like, 
it ticks like almost all the boxes basically um i don't think she's developed as well as i would have liked i think there are certain scenes which are developed really well um um so the scene where she slaughters like 300 soldiers or whatever is incredible i think she she does that brilliantly and that kind of like immediately ramps up the threat of who she is the scene where she goes into those vaults and stuff and like it is unearthing all, all those amazing artifacts and stuff and then as you referenced before when she was describing why odin you know i think that was an amazing one because you know, she's saying, look, Odin's not everything he's cracked up to be. How do you think this all came about? And that was great character development. And then it all kind of went a bit awry. Like it, it kind of, it, it just sort of descended into the sort of very typical villain, villainous behavior and stuff. But in terms of how well she did, I think she did brilliantly. However, and this is my kind of weird, slightly off point. I don't know if she was supposed to do like an Australian accent or something, because if you're watching the film, right, everyone else, their, their sound and everything is all synced up. If you're looking at her lips, and I know that people are going to think I'm insane, but if you're looking at her lips and the words coming out of her mouth, yeah, sync to the sound, it's not quite on. It's just slightly off. It's like a Bollywood film, basically. And, and it's really bizarre. And I don't know if she was supposed to have like a different accent, because I don't know what you think about that. I've read it. I actually kind of, after I, I was watching this live and thinking that, and then I, I sort of Googled it afterwards and like some other people said that as well. So I don't know if that was supposed to be the case or anything like that. I mean, do you have any insight on that? No, I, I wasn't bothered by anything he said, so I don't really, I didn't even pick up on that. Yeah. I mean, so so basically there's like a sort of theory going around that they, they might have made a real last minute change that she was supposed to have like an Australian accent. I, I'd love to know some insider information on this, but, uh, and then it switched to an English one. So um, I, I don't know, that might just be like my OCD or something like that. But it's kind of, it's funny that other people have picked up on that as well. Um, but yeah, so so how do you think Kate Blanchett did as Hella? Okay, I, I was, I'm not going to ruin what's, what, what, what the future is going to be, but I'll just say like, Knowing what I know about the character and and knowing where she's going, like, I mean, this this is this is this is where the plus and the minuses of Marvel Universe comes in, because her story just started. To be honest with you, if you if if, if I'm not going to ruin anything, but I'm just saying, like, she she plays a bigger role than what you think, and it's kind of like what she did here is kind of like just the initial the initial run for her character because she there's a certain character later on that you're going to see in a couple of years that she has a very strong interaction with. So in a sense. This is a spoiled situation. You already know it's, it's supposedly like he seems like he dies. But this is kind of like the beginning of where she goes. That, that's where you don't see too much more character development. It's almost like, because the way the movie sets it up, and I'm going to go by, by pop specifics, she's like a virus. But because um, it just Elba's Elba's character, Heimdall, took the sword away, and she was able to get off of Asgard, like she, you really didn't see her unleash what she's supposed to unleash at this point right there. Okay. They kind of like a tainter, so I can kind of see where you're talking about where she fell off because she was kind of neutered half the movie. Because if if she got off of Asgard, then it's it's not going to be good. Put it that way. And you see how easily she wiped out. It's kind of like setting you up like how terrible she is. So when you see her again later on, and you see what position she's going to be, like they're just telling you like she is not to be fucked with in a sense. So basically, if you look at the pot, the plot structure of the movie, it's pretty much like you see what she's capable of. She's terrible. She's wicked. And then in the middle of the movie, it's kind of like she's trying to get off of that, off of Asgard, because she's basically like a virus. And everything she touches, she kills. You know what I'm trying to say? So it's kind of like she's kind of restrained in a way. So if you're talking about the drop-off, it's an intentional drop-off. Maybe it works for people, maybe it doesn't. I think later on when when you get the next five movies, and you look back on this one, you go, okay, I know, now I know what they did. But I guess if you're going to make the argument, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a devil advocate and defend your point of view or somebody else who has the same feeling... If she feels like she's neutered at the, the second half of the movie, then she was, but it's for a reason. But if somebody, if that's an issue for somebody, then I understand why it's an issue. But I think once you see what she, what her real role is later on, you're going to go, okay, it makes sense now. Because because when they when, she, when they picked her in that role and when and the line "I'm the goddess of death" and and knowing what the goddess of death means for the whole universe. Then I go, okay, I know why they got Kate Blanchett. Because there's no way, I'll, I'll give you this much. If you think about it, there's no way you hire Kate Blanchett for one movie and then kill her off in one movie and move on. Let's put it that way. So I'll, I'll leave it at that right there. But just for this movie alone, I can understand why you, when you see the first half, it's like, holy shit, she's fantastic. And then the second half, is like, she's neutered. But she's neutered for a reason because the plot is telling you that if she didn't have that, if she didn't have the sword to be able to transfer to other planets, then she would have laid waste to pretty much everything. 
But also going back to what I was talking about with the colonialism thing, it's kind of like there's that the two metaphors at hand, where it's kind of like where Odin says Asgard is a people, and then she and then like her power comes from Asgard. So it's kind of like her power comes from Asgard as an institution, and then the, the institution, if you peel it back, is kind of like the whole entire thing where they they took shit from other realms and made it their own. And at some point, Odin stopped that shit, and he kind of saw his. his that's a deeper conversation. I'm not going to Odin thing, but I I talk about that all the time. <laughs> That's yeah. a whole another thing, but basically, it's two different kind of like like versions of Asgard. Asgard is the people that Odin nurtured after he stopped all that 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 uh, that colonialism, and then she's kind of like the old way that it was. In a sense, that that's the reason why Ragnarok had to destroy Asgard because if you look at it, when, as soon as Odin died, the truth came out. As soon as he passed away, that's the moment she came out right there. I, I'm going a little bit too long with that, but basically... No, do you know what? It, it actually, that actually kind of helps, to be honest. It helps mm. put it into context, because I always forget, you know, Kevin Feige has this gigantic master plan and stuff. And, you know, mm. when you're enjoying this film, and it, that visceral thrill of the actual just two hours of it, and, and you come away thinking, oh, yeah, this could have been better, this could be better, but, but you forget about its place within the whole universe. So, yeah. actually, it kind of helps. Like, I'm not a big fan of spoilers, but that's not really a kind of spoiler spoiler. So, no, no. Yeah. I'm not telling you what she's going to do. But no, saying. no. Um, I, I would have predicted she would come back anyway, to be honest. Um, okay. Uh, okay, let's skip those two. Let's go to Tessa Thompson as Valkyrie. So how do you think she did? I thought she was fantastic, personally. I mean, I, I, we, had, we had a Twitter discussion, so I'm pretty sure what you're going to say, so I'm not going to ruin it for people when you say what you said. But like to me, like um, pretty much, it's, it's going to be interesting. I'll, I'll say this. With her, as fun as she is in the movie, I can't wait for her to interact with some of the women later on in the series. I think she's going she's gonna to fit into that dynamic very well. Because I know there's this big giant thing with Marvel, and I think Feige's been turning it around because there's been back, back, back drama when it comes to like Disney and Marvel. And I, Ike Perlmutter, who owns all of, Disney, all of Marvel, but they even bought off of Disney, and Kevin Feige runs the movie division. And there's a clear cut where... Um, Little insight. I'm gonna do it real quick. I'm not gonna ruin the whole entire thing. But basically, Ike Perlmutter is kind of like a guy who believes that women don't sell, and he was very against like toys, making toys for women, making to- girl toys because they don't sell. So Feige, at some point at the, during Age of Ultron, he went to Bob Iger to own a Disney, and he was like, "Listen, if you can't let me have control of this um, the movie division and keep Ike Perlmutter off my back, I'm walking away." So they seen what Feige did, so they split from him. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to see more women coming to Marvel. And you're seeing Black Panther and there's more diversity coming. So there has been this argument at this point. So knowing that backstory and how Ike Perlmutter was and Kevin Feige and stuff like that, and knowing how many more women are going to be involved in Marvel and what they're planning to do going further, I just think that it's great that you have a girl who's not the love interest. She has her own plot line. She's not dependent on the male to save her. It's like everything that you, you expect in a progressive woman, like it's for 2017 standards, she hits all those marks right there. And I think it's very, and, and like, and I already see like little black girls dressing up like Valkyrie and stuff like that. And I think Black Panther's going to add more to that. But I just think it's just great to see, as much as I liked Natalie Portman and the other ones, and she was, and was trying to do the thing where she was kind of like the, the scientist on her own, own thing, but some of the writing didn't kind of hold up. I think the writing with Valkyrie and the way she progressed. And the way that she had her own narrative and pulled herself out of it, and it wasn't up to Thor to kind of pull her out. I mean, Thor gave her Thor gave her like a little pep talk, but she made the choice to kind of go the, the route she wanted to go. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see where she goes further from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with most of that. Um, I, I thought she did a really good job. The character was, I think, the first half of the film, the character was brilliant, and uh, I was just had this gigantic smile on my face, and she was not just funny but tough and you know very nuanced like she had problems she had his issues and stuff like that mm-hmm. and i think it i think it went really well i think kevin feige said that that she is a love interest for thor so maybe not in this film but in in the future i would have thought um it was quite funny how they killed off natalie portman um you know with just with one line basically which mm-hmm. was admittedly yeah. quite funny but i mean you know it's pretty obvious she said look she doesn't want to do it anymore and actually i, I kind of agree with with what marvel have done yeah, okay, it's again it's that fish out of water thing. She's just like a normal person, like who's an American scientist in London or whatever it was. And whereas I think here you've got someone who is more Thor's equal and there's a lot more interest and, and 
power dynamics there. If if Thor and Valkyrie get in a fight, or if they get in a lover's tiff down the road in a couple of years, it's a lover's tiff where like either one of them could die basically in this gigantic right. fight. Whereas if you're talking about with Natalie Portman, that's just never going to really happen and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything else. I'm not going to recover what you what you've said. My my issue, <laughs> my issue with Tessa Thompson as Valkyrie is there's only one thing, right? It's the accent. And I mentioned this on Twitter. I think I since deleted these tweets. Um, I don't know what was going on with her accent. It was all over the fucking shop. It really was. And like, okay, I mentioned with the Kate Blanchett thing, I think hers is an issue that she redubbed her vocals. I think with Tessa Thompson, she's not. She's just doing... And and it's interesting because she worked with some dialect coach called Andrew Jack. And I know this because I watched the credits and saw his name come up because I was so kind of like, I found it so unbelievable how weird her accent was. I was like, something is up with this, basically. One minute, she sounds perfectly English. Next minute, it's just all over the place. She basically almost sounds like Rihanna at one point. And it's just, it was just so bizarre. It was just... It wasn't good enough, I have to say. And the, it wasn't one of these things where you can justify it and say, oh, like, I think I've read this justification that she was supposed to sound like Asgardian, but but because she's been away from there a long time, it's kind of developed into something else, which would be like a transatlantic sort of twang that you'd say, like, say if someone had been in England loads, or born in England, and they lived in America for a few years, and they developed that kind of like twang bullshit this wasn't that she was supposed to she just didn't do the greatest job of the accent i don't think but that's me nitpicking as a londoner so i don't know like i'm sure i'm in the complete minority but that was the thing that irked me about her otherwise i love her i mean her and creed jesus christ and like she i have to say kate blanchett in this hot tessa thompson in this hot i'm not trying to reduce them as female characters i'm just saying my heterosexual blood's coming through right and and i think she did a fantastic job it's just the accent thing i don't know what was going on and I hope I haven't like shattered that glass for anyone else, but um, I don't know. That was the thing that just really irked me. But I, I loved her interactions with uh, with Hulk. It was, those were hilarious and stuff like that. I loved the the banter between her and Thor. Um, she didn't really do that much in the kind of fight sequence. But then, what what you were saying from the director, where he thinks everyone should serve the main kind of focal point of the film, who was Thor? That makes sense to me now. Then, like, so. Um, I mean, I mean that's that's basically it. But she's obviously going to become a huge part of this going forward. So um, I think it's a in- really interesting starting point for her. Okay, speaking of Hulk, he gets a lot in this film actually. So Mark Ruffalo as Bruce Banner and Hulk. Um, I was really shocked actually. At, whilst I was watching the film, I wasn't quite sure what to make of Hulk talking so much. I don't think I've ever heard Hulk talk this much before. So what was the kind of decision making between behind this? Basically, he was Hulk for two years. So actually, he's so 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 so. The, I mean, it's in the comic books. I mean, I hate keep going back to that stuff. But at some point, when it, the, the logic is always like this: the longer Hulk stays Hulk, like for so you could, the logic is this: the longer Hulk stays, he starts picking up on certain things. So basically, he talks like a toddler. So for two years for the Hulk is like toddler years for him, basically. So he talks like a toddler. So he's starting to understand a little bit more, and he's picking up more. Because there's some points, even in a, it's not. I'm not ruining anything for the future movie. They can do this or not do this. But there are certain points where 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 Hulk and Bruce, and certain points in the comic book where Hulk and Bruce Banner are kind of the same person. So to, Hulk likes more eloquent as he goes along in storylines. So he's not like Hulk Smash all the time. And one line at the end of the movie where Hulk starts attacking Surtur the Demon, and then and then uh, Thor goes, Hulk, for once in your life, stop smashing. And like that's a big jump because Hulk is always because Hulk's always angry. Because if you go back to the, when Hulk, when Hulk is talking to um, Thor in his in his room, and him ha- him and Hulk are having an argument, and Hulk's like, I don't know why Hulk is so mad, and he and, and it's at the point where even Hulk himself is starting to get his anger under control, and that's going to be something that you're going to see more in the future of Hulk, like this storyline, kind of like him mastering his anger, even though that's his, that's where his greatest strength comes from. He's starting to tune that out because that's a big jump. Hulk is just like if you see something threatening him, he'll just attack it till he gets tired of attacking it, basically. And it's a funny thing where it's like even beyond Black Widow. <laughs> it cracks me up for how Thor keeps doing the thing, the whole lullaby thing that Black Widow does. You know, the sun going down, and then Mark Ruffalo goes, "Can you stop saying that? That is hilarious. It is hilarious." Okay, yeah. the sun's going down. The sun's going down. The, I think that's. I, I think what helped. I think the the, the the character logic of this movie was 
Hulk is a lot more enjoyable. So when, so when he came out of it and Bruce Banner, Bruce Banner's char character is a little bit more livelier than he is before. Because before Bruce Banner was kind of like somber. Kind of like, you know, I'm trying to keep this monster contained in me in this time. And now as he comes out, I think the, the Hulk is starting to wash off, wash off of him. And he's a little bit more open. He still has that, that, that he's still kind of like neurotic. But he's not like doom saying. He's kind of like, oh my god. He's like, he's like, he's like, he's like nebbishy as compared to like him being somber in the other movies. So I think the Hulk kind of has a bigger, a more effect on him than it than he had before. He's more funnier in this movie than he's ever been. I'll yeah, say that much. Yeah, definitely. And even Bruce Banner, like you were saying, it's kind of it's almost like a Woody Allen neurosis that he turns into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you were going to make a point before. No, I, I, I was afraid about that. But his his humor comes from the situation where. Oh, uh, Thor is kind of like he, he's he's the warrior, but he's a, he's still dealing with his dad thing. But he's still kind of like in the moment trying to enjoy it. Hulk, I mean, because because that's part of Thor's character. He does enjoy being in those situations. Don't get me wrong; he enjoys battle. He enjoys the shenanigans. In spite of that, but but Bruce Banner's humor is he's in this crazy ass place. And he's reacting to it. Like, oh my God, what the hell is this? And it's interesting. They, they still keep that Black Widow love situation storyline going with that. So I, I like that they kind of kept that still going. Going into the next couple of movies, but he was just funny because he was like in circumstances. And when he jumped off of the, it's so funny because if, if people remember the original, um, the first Incredible Hulk with Edward Norton, when he jumps out and then he lands into it and becomes the Hulk. This time he just fuck, he fucking dies and then he turns into the Hulk. <laughs> it's so funny. How he just smacks onto the ground like a pancake, and then all of a sudden, the next thing you know is he comes the Hulk and swings the dog tail, the wolf's tail into the river. That was just hilarious to me. There were just so many moments. It was just brilliant. Even from the beginning where Thor says, oh, it's, it's okay, he's a friend from work and stuff like that. It's just, there were so many classic lines. When he sees um, the Incredible Hulk naked, <laughs> it's just like really immature humor. And it's just, I don't know. The, I think the interplay between them was just brilliant. And the other thing is, you know, when Thor's tr he's talking to Hulk saying, oh, you know, you're almost my, you always been my favorite, you know, not Bruce Banner. I just played to that guy. <laughs> and he switches it around later. It's just, it's classic. And and actually, Hemsworth, it's got to be pretty difficult doing comedy with the CGI thing that you can't see. I don't know how they filmed it and stuff. I don't know behind the scenes. But, you know, it, it kind of, it, it's a testament to how well Hemsworth did the comedy when you're talking to this big green computer goblin, basically, you know, um, and, and he just nailed it. So the interplay between them was brilliant. And, and Ruffalo as Bruce Banner was fantastic, actually, because uh, it's just funny. He's... Uh, basically someone was asking me about this before and um, I was like yeah I don't think there's going to be an Incredible Hulk film now like like a proper Ruffalo Incredible Hulk film because there's not is there I don't think there is, is there? no basically the plan is going to be this because I mean I'll give you a quick insight basically the way the the, the way the rights worked out because Marvel sold the rights because they were going back back rump Marvel can make a, a Hulk movie but the problem with that is is Universal has the first right of refusal so basically, if they make a Hulk movie and Universal wants to wants 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 to distribute it, then they have to go through Universal to distribute it. Because they're making so much money now, they don't want to even give them that distribution right. So what they're going to do now is it's like for this movie, Avengers three and Avengers four, the Hulk is going to have his own arc within those three movies. So it's going to be like between those three throughout those three movies, there's going to be an arc for him that it's going to be like pretty much if he had his own movie. That's how they're going to work that through. But then when they did Spider-Man Homecoming, that's a Sony thing, right? So didn't they just yes. give over all the money to Sony? No, but here's the difference between Spider-Man and, and Hulk is this. Spider-Man is Marvel's Mickey Mouse. He's more important. The thing, with, the thing that Marvel gets out of Spider-Man is it's twofold. This, uh, Sony pays Marvel to make Spider-Man. Spider, but Marvel gets all the merchandise from Spider-Man. Right. Spider-Man is the biggest merchandise and superhero of all time. You think it's Batman, it's not Batman. It's Spider-Man. So it's in Marvel's best interest. I have a three-year-old. I know it's Spider-Man. Trust me. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, it, it, like I said, the, the plan with Spider-Man is is Spider-Man is going to be in an Avengers movie next year, and then the year after, and in 2019, he's not only going to be in the last event, Avengers Four. Right after Avengers Four, that very same summer is Spider-Man Two. So that's what their plan is. So Spider-Man is going to their their Marvel's plan is to re rehabilitate Spider-Man to be back on top again. Even past Batman, that's their goal, which I think they're going to pull off at this point. But at the but so basically, Hulk is kind of like a figure that doesn't sell as much as Spider Man, so that's not much of a thing to them. But Spider Man is like their number one guy. It's like that's their Mickey Mouse. So Spider Man is a different story. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, 
Right, let's rattle through some of the other characters. Uh, Idris Elba as Heimdall. I mean, he wasn't in it that much, was he? Yeah, he was solid as always. He's more of like a like like he's more like a kind of like a um. If you remember Star Wars, Red Antilles. You know, Red. You remember Star. You remember like he's like always. He's always the X Wing fighter pilot. It's, it's weird unless you're a really dire Star Wars fan. He's like really like the X Wing fighter pilot always helps out. Okay, but he's like a minor character, and I. But the, but I think Elba's a little bit more than that. But Heimdall's more like a backup character, but he serves his purpose, kind of situation. Yeah. So, but I know Idris Elba said he's been negotiating. He's been talking to Kevin Feige. He's like, I want more to do. So I'm pretty sure. If he, but here's the interesting thing. I think Kevin Feige is going to going to help him out on this. I think because at the end of the movie, the Asgardians is going to Earth. So all those characters from Asgard are going to be on Earth at some point in the future. So I'm pretty sure you're going to, you're going to wind up seeing um, Idris Elba in more and more movies. I think at this. Point. Okay, but I think just for these movies, I think they wanted to focus on Thor, and then you can't. And here's the thing with movies: I think sometimes I, I tell people it's like you can't give if you have a, a cast that huge, like some characters are going to just be like minor supporting players, like him and Carl Urban. I think were minor supporting players. I think they serve the purpose they're serving, but with 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 the way the Marvel Cinematic Universe is, it's it's only a matter of time before you get your time to shine somewhere in another movie. Yeah. Um... Okay, Jeff Goldblum as Grandmaster. Um, this is what tipped it into Flash Gordon territory for me, basically. While I was watching it, I was just like, oh my God, this has literally just turned into 1980. Uh, so basically he plays this, you know, <laughs> he's he's the brother of um, of Benicio Del Toro's collector from Guardians of the Galaxy, which I didn't know whilst I was watching the film. And uh, I, I thought he was, I thought he was good. Um, I th- I thought he was just basically Jeff Goldblum being Jeff Goldblum. I, d- I didn't think he was really think anything outside of that. Whereas, and I think that was the only thing that slightly disappointed me because it was funny for a while, and then I, I don't know, it kind of like just dragged on a little bit. Um, but I don't know, it was interesting. It was definitely interesting, and he- and he wasn't like the kind of main villain or anything like that because obviously you had Kate Blanchett there, so it was an interesting kind of side villain basically. What did you think of him? I mean, as, as far as the, the metaphor goes, it's interesting because it goes back to that colonial thing with him. Like, he's kind of like the hedonistic ruler. And there's that one line that, is, it, it, this is the one line that's understated, and it kind of like serves the whole purpose of like how you wash over what things actually are. Going back to Korg and the Revolution, where he goes, where the girl goes, where his, his number two goes to him. He goes, well, the slaves revolting. And he goes, oh, I don't like that word. And then she goes, oh. Uh, how, they're just uh, workers that are under your influence. I forgot what exactly the line is, yeah, yeah. As, and, and, and it's kind of like a play off the thing that Odin was doing. So it's kind of like it's kind of like it was kind of like he's the metaphor of kind of like another way of how you bullshit people and take shit over, and kind of like makes a he makes a mess out of things. I mean, there's more. I'm, I, I know I'm still barely scratching the surface of that because there's more. I think there's more. Through it. There's there's a couple of lines I started watching the second time around. I'm like, okay, they're commenting on that thing with Odin at some point. And that line was like the biggest tip off. It's like, okay, so now you're trying to like clean over what they actually are and try to say, well, it's like he's trying to be politically correct. Like, and like, and like going back to it where he goes when he when he when he shocks, when he melts the guy, yeah, and he sounds really good, but it's actually torture. And then the girl's confused later on, and he and then she hands him, she wants to hand him the melter again. He's like, well, that's not an offense. And she's like looking at him like, okay, like your logic is irrational because you'll overreact for one thing and do another thing. And then the other scene is um in the battle scene where um. Thor's about to overtake uh, the Hulk. And he's like, "Oh, we can't have that," and he <laughs> yeah. like shocks him down. And you can see he's kind of like a, like that. He plays the benevolent dictator, but he's really a dictator. He's not really that good of a guy, but he does that Jeff Goldblum thing where he's so likable. But if you really look at what he's fucking doing, it's like Odin. Like Odin's like you think he's a wise old man, but he's actually doing some pretty terrible stuff. He takes Loki and like that's I don't know who that wrote. But Jeff Goldblum is very similar to what Odin is doing in a sense. But only he's doing it in a Jeff Global me way. Like, I'm a likable guy, but he's actually pretty terrible. Yeah, it's kind of like he's like this slave owner or whatever who who's doing all the things, all the really bad things that a slave owner would do. But he's justifying it to himself by trying to be likable or, or being, look, I really don't want to do this, but ends up killing that person anyway kind of thing. And, and it's like, you know, you get people like that in life. You know, I'm sure there were lots of slave owners in America or around the world or still are probably who are like that. You know, I, I really don't want to do this. I'm not comfortable with it. But they will do it anyway, you know, or, the, or they'll manipulate the situation so that it, 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 they can kind of morph it into something they're more comfortable with, but the end result is exactly the same for the people that they are subjecting all this shit to, basically. So, um, I, you know, it was interesting. It's just, um, 
I, I don't know. I, I think maybe it was a little bit. Also, the post end credit was him. And I was like, oh, I fucking waited five minutes here. And, you know, didn't think it was the best, to be honest. I'm sure there's some great meaning behind it, but I, I just didn't find it brilliant. Um, okay, let's carry on. Carl Urban, a scourge. We can probably rattle through that pretty quickly. He, he's a New Zealander, though, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I thought, yeah. I thought he was Australian, but maybe he's in New Zealand. No, he's in New Zealand. I thought he said Yeah. Okay. Um, what was he famous from? Because I keep hearing his name. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. He was. Um, he was Lord of the Rings. He was. He was. Uh, he was a McCoy in the Star Trek movies. Oh, he was born. oh shit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. He was Judge Dredd. <laughs> I didn't see Judge Dredd. Yeah. Like, but may, I mean, mainly his, his first big thing was he, he played Eremir in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's coming back to me. Well, that makes sense. New Zealander, uh, Peter Jackson. Lord of, okay. Fine. Fine. Mm. Um, okay. That makes sense. Uh, he's pretty buff though. He wasn't like that in the, like back then, was he? Um, he yeah. I, I thought he did a pretty good job. I mean, it was pretty obvious. It was telegraphed that he was, you know, being naughty and then decided to make good choices in life and stuff. So, um, you know, uh, I don't know. He didn't really do much, though, if you kind of analyze it, like, except sort of, I I don't know, like, he he didn't even execute anyone in the end, I guess. So it was just like, it it was a little bit, I I guess my my issue was that you took out Heimdall's, like, Idris Elba's screen time and gave it to Carl Urban. And I don't know if it was ultimately justified, but I mean, it was fine. It was whatever. But I don't know what you thought. I mean, it's basically, I mean, like, going back to the, the colonial thing, it's like some people who clearly know this thing is wrong. But you're going along with it out of fear. He let his fear take over in a sense. In a sense. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I can't do that. For like how, you know how it's almost like when people, when, when, when you look through history and people say, well, how do they go along with that? Mm. And then she, and she played and like, remember when she tried to give, he tried, he's like, she's like, what do you want? And then she's like, he gave, he gave the backstory. She didn't care about the backstory. He's like, she played on what he wanted to be. He's like, I want, I wanted some kind of like meaning and stuff like that. And she kind of played on his ego in a sense. But then he knew what was wrong. He was walking along with it. He represents that person that even though it's no it's wrong, you're still going on with it. And you go, how do they go along with it? And they play on your fear and they play on your ego. And to the point where he's like, I can't do this no more. And then he still kind of, in the way, he still got punished for it because he should have did that shit from the start. At the end of the day, it was going to come and bite him in the ass, no matter how good he did at the end. It's kind of Anakin Skywalker in a sense. Like, you know you're doing wrong. And you, and you know you're raised not to do it wrong. And you know it's wrong. But you still went along with it. And even though you try to do the right thing at the end, you still kind of fucked up. I, do you know what? I think that's too deep. I think this is self-preservation. I think he saw Hela and it's like, there's no way I can do anything about that. She's like all powerful, basically. What am I literally going to do here? And it's just, I'm going to go along with what she says. And if I can get the best position of power within that to safeguard myself, I think that's what he was doing. I don't think there's anything yeah. deeper than that, to be honest. No, but the other people didn't do that, though. That's my point. Yeah, the and they're dead. Do so he's not, basically. Exactly. So that's my point. You know, I think it's as simple as that, really. Um, okay, I think the last big one really is Odin, um, who... Is he basically turns into Obi Wan Kenobi in this film? Um, mm-hmm. It's a bit strange how they do it. Like they, I've read some criticism of of how they kind of got him, <laughs> put him in a retirement home, and he's not there anymore. And then he turns into Obi Wan Kenobi. So, I mean, how do you think that all went down? I mean, if you're if, if you're going back to the comic books, this is going to be something where they were going to spend fifteen minutes explaining about the Odin sleeves. But basically, I mean, uh, I'm gonna be a bit. basically. Because because Loki kicked him out of Asgard, and you remember that all their power stemmed from Asgard, and he's the All Father. Basically, if he doesn't get his rest in Asgard for a long period of time, he's been off there for like two years. Then he was he was dooming himself to die, and he was ready to go anyway because his wife wasn't there anymore. He was basically tired of doing what he was doing in a sense. I mean, Odin's arc is and this is just talking about don't try to think. If you look back on it, it's kind of the same thing with um with uh, in the Winter Soldier how Shield was was pretty much like founded by Hydra and it's the bullshit and Obi and Obi's pretty much basically tied to the bullshit. And basically he left his sons to clean it up. Once again, he didn't take responsibility for his own actions. Cause you look at Thor the Dark World, it's like Thor starts coming around and cause there's a line in Thor the Dark World, he's like, where Thor says to Odin, he goes, It seems like to me, the longer people are on that throne, the more corrupt and more destructive it is. And I walk away from the throne. And basically that's what Thor walked away from. And then you find out in in um in Ragnarok that is true. That Odin was consumed with power. And then at some point, most likely the birth of his son, Thor, it seems like that's the point where he changed. And then Hela's anger is like, so you waited to him to get born for you to have this about face? And that's kind of like where Hela's anger is in that the hypocrisy of Odin, where you did all this warmongering and taking over. 
And in a way, you look back to the first Thor movie, and Odin kind of sees his old. If you look, if you take all the stuff into account of how Odin kind of like is now, and if you watch the original Thor, and he gets mad at Thor because Thor is a warmonger in the beginning of Thor. Thor's answer to everything in the first Thor movie is, "Let's go kill the false giants." And Odin is like, "Well, there's more to it. There's more to it. Diplomacy." You kind of see how, and if you look at it in the past, you see kind of like that's kind of how Odin was, and now you see this one thing where Odin was a warmonger. And he's trying to teach Thor, like, that's not the way to go. And Thor kind of has, like, a balance that Loki and Hela and Odin didn't have back then. In a sense. You know? So, that's the kind of thing right there. But, it, it, but, if you, but if you didn't take the other two movies into account and sit there and look at that, then the, by the movie by itself and the time they gave Odin, you'd be like, okay, what the hell? I give you that. Yeah. I, I thought it was fine. I mean, it, it kind of served its purpose in the end. Uh-huh. Ultimately, he's supposed to become this thunder god, and this this is how it kind of, you know speaks mm. to him. Oh, the Odin Force, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so it, it did the job. I mean, there you go. Pretty much. Um, there, there are a couple of other ones. There's Doctor Strange and uh, Korg that I wanted to speak about. So Doctor Strange, oh, I don't know. This kind of reminded me how I didn't actually like Benedict Cumberbatch as Cumberbatch Doctor Strange that much. Mm. I know it's one of your favorite ones, but um, oh yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess this was a necessary thing or whatever, and it's showing how powerful he's become and stuff. Um, Korg, I thought was brilliant. That was the director, Waititi, mm. who's, who's portraying Korg, and I thought he was hilarious. Um, I mean, were there any kind of characters that you want to speak about otherwise? No, Korg was, Korg was great. To me, the, the Doctor Strange thing is, is crazy. Like, it, it's another character moment to see, like, how, how much of a prodigy, prodigy, a prodigy, prodigy of, a, of, of a person that he is. Because he pretty much, like, it's crazy how powerful he is. And that's going to show you how much of a threat he's going to be to Thanos because he pretty much, like, they were, like, nothing, like, flies to him pretty much at that point. Even Loki, somebody who's a, who's a great magician, it's kind of like he can't even handle Doctor Strange at that point. It's like, you know what? You bother me, guy. It's a little reminder of what Doctor Strange's responsibility on Earth is. His responsibility is to make sure that magic is balanced on Earth. And it's kind of like he tells, he tells Thor, it's like, if I, do, if, if I help you guys out, do you guys got to get off the planet? Because his job is to make sure that the the, the nat- like nature is in balance and, and, and these magical creatures and magical people will come to Earth and fuck shit up, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So it's like a little reminder of not only that he's still doing his job, but at the same time how incredibly powerful he is that even he can he can easily beat Thor or Loki. It's ridiculous how powerful he is. So it's gonna so you can only imagine later on what, what it's gonna take to bring him down. Yeah, it's ramping it up nicely. You know, Doctor mm-hmm. Strange is going to take more and more of a prominent role, I guess, isn't he? Um, mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I thought, like I said, Korg, hilarious. So they had some, yes. some of the best lines and stuff like that. And I love that, that that voice made it in, that kind of, that real kind of Kiwi or Polynesian voice kind of made it into the film. Um, I, I just, I don't know, it really helped sort of ground it in, in where this has come from because... I think a lot of this has probably come from the director himself, from YTT, and I haven't actually seen any of his films. So um, I think on a couple of days ago on a terrestrial, or well, on like Film 4 in the UK, they showed his film Boy, so I've recorded it, so I haven't watched it. Um, I haven't seen the other two ones that he's more famous for, but I mean, like if, it's, if this is anything to go by, I'm sure his work is just going to suddenly shoot up in perception and value and stuff like that. So uh, I can't really wait to start watching his films. Um, that there was one very funny scene uh, near the beginning of the film where Matt Damon is in it <laughs> and uh, Luke Hemsworth and stuff, and they're portraying the um, <laughs> they're portraying the sequence for Loki who's pretending to be Odin and stuff like that. I thought that was hilarious. Um, in terms of the rest of the film, I think the sound was fantastic. Uh, probably one of my favorite Marvel films thus far, and and you got that Led Zeppelin song. Ah! And the immigrant song that was cool well done um the visuals were great the pacing was excellent i don't know i just uh, the, the part of me is kind of like i'm even feeling guilty for dissecting this film because i just think it's something more to be enjoyed but then i also completely recognize that for a different category of fans there this is something to dissect because like you're illuminating in loads of other different parts of this and what it's going to mean in the future what it meant for the past all this kind of stuff so i think i think it's it's kind of like i said i think this is going to be a great gateway drug film actually and like flash gordon like kind of almost like willy wonka as well like i, I don't know it's kind of this really weird and wonderful thing that will kind of 
I think this film, more than most Marvel films, will emanate throughout the rest of the, the continuing Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's just this hunch I've got. Um, I might be completely wrong, but I don't know. Um, like, I, I guess we should start wrapping this up. What are your closing thoughts on it? No, like I said, but I said I pretty much got a feeling, like for all the reason that you were saying, that because I, I think there's two. I think there's two movies. It, it, well, it depends to be seen because it depends on how how far this movie goes. Because I know as we're speaking. It made 141 million in America, and worldwide right now it made 425 million worldwide on a budget of I think 180. Wow. So they're they're already good right now, and this is Marvel's 17th number one right here. And I think Disney bought all of Marvel for four billion dollars, and the movie division alone um, made 13 billion. So there's that, and I think and not a Marvel universe. Has surpassed uh, Star Wars as the most profitable um, movie series at this point. But getting back to what I'm saying, I think there's two movies that are going to be the biggest crowd pleasers. I, I still I still argue that maybe um, Thor Ragnarok may have less fans only because I've been seeing on the internet and I've seen some other places. Even my even my um, my brother's wife who loves the first two Thor, she loves the first two Thor. She loves Jane and she loves Thor. She wasn't a big she wasn't as big of a fan of this one as she was the other two. Okay. If I'm being honest. Yeah. My brother, however, wasn't a big fan of the other two stories. But he liked this one way more than the other two stories. So I think, and like I said, there's some people who are going to prefer it. I still think that at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, going, to argue, I'm going to argue that the first Avengers is still the big giant gateway. Because that's the one that everybody jumped on board when the first Avengers came out. I think that was a moment in time where everybody was like, nobody thought that these characters could ever come together. Because I remember when, the first, when Iron Man first came out, nobody thought, even comic book fans, Nobody thought that people would see an Avengers movie or you would see these characters come together. But that one was like such a big event. I think that one made like 600 million in America alone. And that's rare for something to go past. I think on average, an American movie hits maybe a, a, a smash on average, maybe like 300, 350. And that one went beyond that. I think the first Avengers still may be the overall big crowd pleaser. I think this one will pull in new people. And I think going forward, I think while Titi said he wants to do another Thor movie, I think going forward, like the same way that that with each Marvel movie they make more and more money, which is rare for a series. I think that Rag, like whatever Taka does with this, the next Thor movie, I think that may be the one. I think because what Marvel usually does is this: they kind of have some kind of grip on the first movie. Obviously, they gave Vatiti their voice, but I think they're going to give him more, even more freedom to do what he wants to do, knowing that that it works. And I think that the next Thor is going to be the one where it's going to be he's like unleashing full Vatiti. If you watch uh, What You Do in Shadows and How the World of Older People, then you'll see what I'm talking about. But I think that out of all the three this year, I think that everybody's going to have their favorite. Because I do see it's the, I do see on the internet it's divided. It's, I think some people love Thor than other Spider-Man and Guardians. Some people take the themes of Guardians to heart. And then some people are Spider-Man fans. They're going to love Spider-Man more than other two because Spider-Man Spider-Man. So it's going to be very tough to say who's their favorite. And it goes back to a bigger picture of what the MCU is. Like, everybody has their favorite series. Some people just prefer Captain America movies. Some people just prefer Thor movies. Some people prefer Iron Man movies. But I think this one is going to be a big crowd pleaser. But I don't think it's going to be as big as Avengers was when it first came out. Yeah, and I, I mean, the last point is that talking from a boring business perspective. So basically, Disney... Uh, pulling all their stuff, all their content from Netflix and other platforms. And that's because they want to launch their own streaming service. I think it's due in 2019, which is like a couple of years from now or like 18 months from now, whatever. And I, I think that they're timing it with, obviously you've got Star Wars and everything like that, but I think Marvel is going to be a big puller as well. You've obviously got all the kids' films, but it just wouldn't surprise me if you see like this real kind of like a halo effect from Disney streaming service on the Marvel films and then that ultimately pushes the other Marvel films forward even more so like you were saying that 2020 is when there's there's going to be like this kind of real reckoning with Marvel Universe and if you've got like a year of people catching up on all the Marvel films because they've got this Disney streaming thing it's going to really kind of it's like how you know Shawshank Redemption was a flop at the cinema but VHS rentals made it the biggest film ever kind of thing you know on you know what i mean but so i think it will kind of be like that um and you'll get this whole new generation of fans by that stage by 2020 how old's my son gonna be he's gonna be like six like pushing seven like once it's 2020 and 
you know, that's the sort of age that he'll really start getting into certain Marvel films, I guess. You know, I have to sort of yeah. time it. Like, I don't want to ruin him, but, you know. So so I think I think it's going to be interesting, basically. I, I think, and this is going to be one of the most entertaining ones, Bonan. I can imagine this on streaming services just pulling in crazy numbers. You know, you just, you go out on a Friday night and think, yeah, let's just chuck on Thor Ragnarok, you know, and when you come home at three in the morning and stuff. I think it's going to be one of those films. I think it'll probably become a cult classic as well. In 30 years' time, like... These kids will be like, oh, yeah, do you remember, you know, Thor Ragnarok rah, 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 and stuff? So uh, I think, I just think they did a great job. If you're talking about a movie firing on almost all cylinders, I think this does the job pretty well, I have to say. Like, uh, I think that's all you can really ask. And, and it's also great that they gave this huge a movie to such a sort of unrecognized director, basically, if you're talking about like commercially, you know. So um, it, it's very brave of them to do that, basically. Okay, I think we should probably wrap that up. We were well, <laughs> went well over on that and we barely scratched the surface. Um, so, yeah, we are on Twitter at T underscore Rebels and Facebook at Transatlantic Rebels Podcast. So that's all from us and see you next time. Peace. Peace.